I'm using a screen background, um, as you might have noticed. Uh, in reality, this uh, is what you would see if you were with me in the room, a much different setup. And I think a lot of us are dealing with all kinds of new circumstances, new environment, um, new teaching role, um, new way of teaching, and, and it's really challenging. And I, and I wanna just applaud uh, everyone who's doing this and, and making this rapid transition right now because it's not easy and it takes a lot of balancing of, of professional and personal obligations and, and also just a lot of, of um, risk taking, trying new things and teaching in new ways. Uh, just a couple quick things about me. I'm, I'm, these are the three things that matter most to me, my family, uh, the journalism um, that I, I believe in and, and, uh, and teaching. And so that's what I focus on uh, these days. And, and I'm teaching at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, which is now an online school of journalism all of a sudden. So all of us are, are, are adjusting to that and, and adapting to that new reality. Uh, and uh, one, more, one more quick poll. I think, I think this is one that, um, that uh, always interests me. I'm always curious what people are doing um, in terms of their sleep. I think it's super, super important, um, especially in this new world that we actually refresh ourselves and, and restore ourselves um, given how much, how many challenges we face. Um, so uh, a quick poll about sleep. How many hours did you sleep uh, last night? If you wouldn't mind sharing, these are all anonymous by the way. Um, and um, I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to respond to that. I think we'll move past that one. I wanna, I wanna make sure we get to the, the next stuff. Um, but you get the idea in terms of polling. From a teaching perspective, it's nice to keep people engaged, to ask them things, to, to try to bring them into the conversation. Um, in the rest of the session this morning, I'm going to focus on openers. How do we actually open sessions in a few different ways? Um, uh, some activities for remote sessions. And these are mainly uh, intended for educators, but they're, they're really applicable in other kinds of contexts as well, if you're working collaboratively on, on various kinds of journalism projects. Some closers to end the session. I think it's, it's helpful to end sessions with intention so that we don't just run out of time, but we actually decide we're gonna wrap up the session in a bow and complete it with a, with a feeling of conclusion. And I'll say more about that toward the end of this session. And we'll see if I can follow suit and end on time and, and end with a nice bow on the end of this session. And then a couple more tools I'll throw in uh, throughout the, throughout the, uh, the session and, and before we wrap up. So that's where we're, we're heading. And just quick tech check, you're seeing my slides, you're seeing the, you're hearing me and you're in your, uh, here in your, you're seeing me on screen, you're seeing the slides and you're hearing me, right? I just wanna make sure everyone's with me on that. And you can just mention in the chat, just someone give me a, a thumbs up or a yes, and I'll know that you're hearing me. There are three things, great, thanks Kelly. And thanks Vanessa. Um, there are three things that we're aiming to do in my view when we're teaching, whether it's in person or, but especially remotely. Number one is being engaging. So we don't wanna bore people. We don't wanna have people feeling like, wow, I wish I were, watching a video game or doing something else or, or running outside. We wanna also be effective. So, you know, we're teaching remotely and it's more difficult, it's more challenging, there are limitations, but actually, actually I think we can do a lot of really effective teaching um, online and remotely because we have everyone at our, at our fingertips, really. They're um, connecting with us virtually, um, but they're able to type things, to do things. They're all with us in the same room, even though it's a virtual room. And finally, I think this should be enjoyable. Uh, we're all under a lot of stress. People are facing all kinds of family situations. They're facing a lot of questions about the, the economy and, and what's gonna happen with the journalism profession or whatever other field they might be in. Um, they, they might be in really confined conditions. So given all of that, I think it's important that we, we keep that in mind and we make things fun and interesting. And in general, I think learning should be enjoyable. People should be excited that a class is about to start or that they're about to learn something. So a couple of, of words about openers. Um, uh, first, here's an example of one I like to play um, with pictograms. Um, it's called Brain Spin, and there's a deck full of, of pictograms, but you can do this in a Zoom session as well. And so um, you can do this right now for yourself. And just look at this little pictogram. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, a little pictogram. It looks a little bit like a, maybe a bubble wand or glasses or binoculars. Those are all things, for example, that I see when I look at that. And by giving people a chance to just open up their minds, you give them a pictogram, you give them a chance to open up their minds and just be creative and think about as many things as they can from that object. And one of the things that we can do with something like this is we don't have to use tools for it. We have a chat that's built into Zoom. We can just ask people a simple question or give them a simple puzzle or give them a simple pictogram and ask them to respond to that. And that can be a fun, quick little way of, of opening a session. This could be an image and we ask people to identify where it is. We could give people an image and ask people um, 
to, to describe what angle this was taken from or with what aperture. It could be a, a headline and we could ask people to comment on how to cut one or two words from that headline. There are all kinds of ways we can pose these interesting or engaging or little puzzle questions, uh, whether related to a visual, whether related to a piece of text. We could play them a little video through screen sharing and ask them what was surprising about that opening statement that somebody made. There's all sorts of ways to give people a little bit of a quick puzzle, a quick question, quick challenge. Um, I want to encourage you to try out this tool for that, for that kind of a, a question or poll. Um, it's called slido.com. And there's two ways. I want you to try this out because you can actually engage with this in real time to see what it's like from a student perspective or a participant perspective. So you can take out your phone and point it at the screen with the camera mode on. And that will show you, if you point it at the QR code, it'll actually open up the poll page for you right now. Um, so again, you just t open up your phone, point it at the screen once it's in the camera mode, point it at the QR code, and you'll see it loads up a web page with uh, an active question. The other way you can do this, if you'd prefer, you can open up a new browser tab and just go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and it'll ask you what code do you want to use? What, what code do you want to use for this meeting? And you can type in Jeremy, my first name. Either of those ways will get you into this session at Slido. And what Slido allows you to do is pose poll questions. They can be multiple choice questions uh, like we've used in Zoom, but they also can be open-ended text questions. In this case, I posed a question about how are you feeling today? But Slido also allows you to do a couple other things, which I'll show you. So Slido allows you to have an open Q&A so people can ask questions as the session is going. It also allows you to ask for ideas. So you can pose a question, people can share their ideas in the second tab. The third tab is where you go to the live polls. So I've turned on this live poll and you can see the responses are coming in um, as we speak and you can continue to respond to this poll as I'm explaining Slido. And one nice thing is that we get an instant reaction, we get an instant um, demonstration of the point or, or we get a, a shared feeling about what people are feeling or doing. This could be really anything. It could be a comment on yesterday's coverage of the COVID crisis in New York City um, in terms of local TV media. It could be a question about the biggest issue that's going to face local retail businesses in the wake of the COVID-related economy uh, challenges. It could be really anything. And I like doing one word just because you can, you can create a word cloud and people can see it quickly. But you can also create questions that are uh, longer questions or that require a fuller response. And I'm gonna to switch to one of those just so you get a sense of what that is. Um, and so here's a new question that I'm gonna pose on the screen. What do you find most challenging about teaching online in a sentence? This could be um, something personal that you've experienced or it could be a theoretical thing that you've experienced or that you imagine to be the most difficult, really whatever you want, however you wanna answer. This is an anonymous. And that's another thing I like about these polls. So if you're in an open discussion, you can ask people questions and they can type in the chat their answers. But those, are, those require people to associate their identity with what they're saying. And they might not always feel comfortable about answering um, questions depending on the kinds of questions you're asking them. So with Slido or other tools like it, other polling tools like it, you can allow people to answer anonymously, which gives them the comfort and freedom to be really authentic and, and honest and candid. Um, there are other tools like this. I'll show you a couple of others. One thing I like about Slido in particular is that it's free to create three questions for any session um, and that it allows you these three separate tabs. So people can ask questions in the Q&A tab. They can share ideas about a, a, a question you've posed in the idea tab. And in the live um, poll tab, they can easily join through a QR code or through a simple customizable code like the one I've set today, which is just my first name. And you can ask different kinds of questions, like these uh, open-ended text questions. So here are some challenges that you've identified. that They're not face-to-face. -face. You can't see people up close. It's hard to know if they're slacking off. Somebody points out they, they might be you know, daydreaming and not even paying attention. Um, incidentally, just a quick aside, Zoom used to have an attention tracker where you could actually see if people weren't on the session or if they were looking at other tabs. They turned that off just this weekend last weekend because people felt that was a privacy violation. So that's an interesting, uh, <laughs> an interesting issue there. Um, sitting in the chair for an extended period of time. I've heard a couple of professors talk about getting up and doing stretches and having people do stretches. I think that's a great idea. Um, it's hard to balance. You, you can't see yourself versus your slides. That's another challenge. Um, 
figuring out what the audience sentiment is can be challenging. You can't see people's reactions. I can't see you on screen right now. I'm looking at a full screen of my slide, for example, keeping people engaged and getting them to do something. So there are lots of these different things. Um, knowing who's paying attention. Yeah, so several of you mentioned that. So these are all examples of things that we can, we can um, continue to discuss. I'm gonna switch back. I'm using a Slido switcher. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an application on the phone that connects to my presentation on Keynote. Uh, no, you can't do text input. Um, somebody asked a question about, you can't do text input on um, Zoom. Yeah, one of the limitations of the Zoom built-in questions is that you cannot ask open-ended questions within Zoom. You can ask polls, but the polls are questions like I asked you, what's your favorite drink of choice? Or how's your morning been? They're, they're, they're um, kind of um, multiple choice. And you can ask people for one to choose one option or multiple options, um, like which media source do you use uh, during this crisis to keep up with news, social media, newspapers, magazines, TV, you can choose multiple answers, but you can't ent enter open-ended text. So that's one of the limitations of, of Zoom. Okay, I'm gonna move on to some qualities of, of uh, engaging openers. And there, there are really six things that, that I've identified as, as being super important from my perspective um, when, when developing opening openers for, for classes. I, I really feel like the first 300 seconds, I've written about this before, are really important. Just like when you make a first impression on a person, the, the first five minutes, are really important in a session. Um, in Zoom or other kinds of sessions, we often have to wait a couple minutes for people to arrive. But once we're getting going, it's really important to set the tone. So I think we need something that's active. We need something where people are doing something, whether it's a poll question, whether it's a little game, a little activity, a little challenge. And I'll give you a few examples of specific ones in a moment. I think they should be brief, so we should move on to something after that. Um, I think they should be connected either to people themselves and their lives and their situation, like the fact that we're going through this COVID situation we're in confined spaces we're facing new constraints or or connected to the broader topic that we're focused on in this case uh the, the journalism subject or whatever else you're you're teaching in particular i think they should be something you can do over and over so you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel for every single session so there should be polls that you have kind of ready to go either templatized in your zoom or if you have slido you can reuse polls if you have other tools like Socrative, you can store a whole library of different questions and little exercises or games or quizzes. Um, or you just kind of have them at your ready in whatever organizational tool you use for managing things so that they're easy to recreate and easy to redo. I often have in, in teaching in person a deck of cards, a few different games ready to go so I don't have to reinvent them every single time. Uh, they should be easy for you to do and for people to participate in. And I think they should be fun. So, uh, so let, me, let me give you some examples of some other ones. Uh, in Zoom, I like to ask people to, ask, uh, to pose a meaty question. So I asked you what, what was one of the most challenging things. I could have asked you about questions you have about teaching. Um, in, a, in a classroom setting, I would ask something like, if I were teaching, um, let's say business reporting, um, what's one of the big questions facing retailers who are looking six months ahead uh, out from in this COVID crisis? What's, what, what's one question on their mind? So this is a little bit about metacognition. It's a little bit about getting students to think from a perspective of people they're reporting on, but essentially asking people to create a question, um, which is fodder for discussion. So another thing that we can ask people to do as an opener is to share a six word insight. So it, again, it, it really depends on what your subject matter is. Um, but let's say we're teaching science journalism and we want people, we're, we're thinking about the CDC, um, explain the, 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 pl the most, surprising thing the CDC has had to do in recent months um, in six words, or um, explain why the CDC uh, was underappreciated before this crisis, or whatever it is in six words, kind of giving people a chance to focus their thinking, to practice being concise, to practice some self-editing, to practice some reflection, analytical thinking, and then they can see each other's responses. Um, you can do this at the beginning of a session. These can also be closers as well. Another thing is a, is a brain dump. Some people call it a free write or a one minute paper. But the idea is you get people just writing for one minute and you actually time it. You actually say, okay, I'm gonna give you one minute, give you a little few seconds to get ready. We're not gonna do this now, but, um, but in a session you could give people a few seconds to get ready. And then you say, okay, we're gonna do 60 seconds and you're gonna write on this particular prompt, right? What are the three big issues facing retailers um, that they hadn't expected before this COVID crisis hit? Or if you're doing, um, uh, international reporting. Uh, what's one thing that uh, American outlets have done differently from some in of their international uh, um, uh, alternatives, or whatever the question is. Um, and they can do this either in a Google Doc on their own, you can have a shared Google Doc, 
and publish it and give everyone the link so everyone's working in the same doc. That can sometimes be messy until people are used to it, sectioning it out. You can do it within the Zoom chat if you're comfortable with that. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can use one of the tools I'll show you momentarily. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do that free write, but the important thing is you get people writing, you get people doing something immediately early in the session. Um, and then different kinds of polls. And there are three kinds of polls that in my view, there's social polls, sort of how are you feeling? What drink do you like in the morning? That kind of stuff. Topical polls, so about journalism, what, what media outlets are you finding most reliable during this crisis? Or input poll, you know, how are you doing in this course? What, what should we be covering more? How effective was that exercise or assignment? Um, those kinds of input uh, questions about what you're doing. By the way, I didn't mention this, but I'll share the I'll share a link at the end, which has the slides and the um, tools that I'm referencing in this. So you can refer back to that if that's helpful, uh, or back to the recording if that's useful. So Slido I've mentioned and we've looked at, I'm gonna move on. This is an example of a tag cloud from a recent um, webinar that I led, and you get a feeling for how you can see on one screen a lot of different um, feelings, and, and, and it's very easy for people to respond to these, um, which is again why I like this kind of tag cloud. Um, and uh, there are other tools for this, like Socrative, that's another one. I'm gonna pull out here for a quick second and show you what that looks like um, when, we're actually, when we're actually on the Socrative site. So I've set up a Socrative poll here, and I have a room with just my name Kaplan, so students would go to Socrative.com and choose student and then type in Kaplan. And one thing I like about Socrative is you can use it flexibly and imp improvise with it. So in this case, I didn't pose a pre-question, I just said answer the question I'm going to say, right? So during the session as you're teaching, you can say, what do you think about that? We've just been talking about so such and such, or so-and-so has just made this interesting point. What do you think about that? So with the other polling tools, you generally have to have a preconceived question, although you could use them in this way, I suppose, if you wanted to, but Socrative allows you to sort of open up a, a true-false or open up a multiple choice. How would you grade you know, Trump's performance um, uh, in terms of media or whatever, um, A, B, C, D? And you can basically just create the question on the fly. Um, so, so that's one thing I like about Socrative. Um, you can also have uh, quizzes that will be self-graded, which is also distinct in Socrative. So if you're using it for formative assessments or to see how people are doing in terms of their understanding, that's a, a valuable use of it. Poll Everywhere is another one. I'm gonna move along um, because we're, we're, we're in a mini webinar here. So I'm gonna move, move on and talk about some remote exercises during the class session. These should be aligned with what you're doing in the rest of the, the, the class, your learning goals. I think they should be broken up. So things people are doing remotely on their own should be broken up into smaller pieces. Sometimes we give people these big projects to do and I think they need more scaffolding, they need more help, do this, just this one step today, or just spend an hour doing this one thing, finding three new sources, or examining this particular question and interviewing two or three specific people. Um, I think we need to help them along with those broken up steps more than we assume in some cases. I think the instructions should be crystal clear, it should be doable, so it should be within their range, something they've either done before or we've prepared them to do. Sometimes we assume they can do things, people can do things, and they haven't been given that preparation. Should be fun, again, enjoyable, and they should be flexible so we can adapt based on the circumstances. So given that people are at home and given that such and such is happening, here's a, an, a way to, to adapt to that. Um, I think essentially we can ask people to do these three kinds of things. To curate things, to create things or collaborate on things, and to critique things. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at a couple examples. Um, people can curate material onto a Pinterest board. And Pinterest doesn't have to be for visual things. You can have people curate onto a Pinterest board um, interesting examples of coverage of retail businesses and their challenges faced, or international reporting projects around the world that have addressed the COVID crisis with creative data visualizations or whatever. They can do that on a Pinterest board or a Trello board. You can have them create something like a Google slide deck explaining the CDC's main functions during a crisis like this one. Or a whimsical, whimsical is a tool that allows you to create um, mind maps or flow charts or diagrams. And you can ask them to create a quick diagram outlining how the communication flows through the US government, if it's an explanatory science project, for example. Those are things they can create individually or with a partner, with a colleague and collaborate. They can also collaborate on a shared CODA document or Notion document. And these two are terrific tools that are kind of like Google Docs on steroids. They allow you to create documents that have embedded images, videos, maps, tables, charts, all sorts of stuff in the document. And people can collaborate and add to the document together and then 
publish them, almost like a, a website. So they're really quite elegant. I'll show you a couple of quick examples in a minute. Um, and lastly, they can critique something. So there's a lot of stuff going on out there. They can't get out there and report themselves in person in many cases, obviously now, but they can take coverage that exists or documents that exist and annotate that. They can use a tool like Hypothesis, um, which is .is at the end. It's a free annotation tool or Document Cloud or many other tools, Edgy. There's a lot of tools where you can have people annotate either a website or a PDF. And, and, uh, and that's a, a way for them to kind of critique or analyze coverage. So I'm gonna show you what a Coda doc looks like and what a Notion doc looks like. I'm gonna go back out here to the web and I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. Um, here is a uh, example of a Coda doc. It has a slide deck, it has various um, websites in it. It has uh, other material that I've embedded in it. It also allows people to ask questions, add questions. So this could be something that people, reporters share with the public or people in their community in Mott Haven or wherever else. And the people can um, add a topic that should be covered, for example. Code is really a rich, um, rich tool for creating, again, Google Docs on steroids. Another example of a tool like that is called Notion. And both of these uh, are, well, Notion is free for educators, by the way. Coda is $2 a month for educators, which is 80% off of its normal price. Um, and they both have all kinds of templates. So I'm just showing you a couple of templates. This is a course schedule. This is a lesson plan in Notion. So you get the sense that you can create these really kind of robust, it's almost like creating a web page, but you're just using a document. Um, and it can have images. You can really do a tremendous amount. Um, and these are really, really robust tools that you can just use to move up from just using basic Google Docs if you want to try something a little bit new. Um, I, I may come back and do another webinar about those tools specifically because they're really so rich um, and there's so much to them. I encourage you to, to try them. These are um, tools you're gonna be hearing more and more about. Notion just this week got $50 million of investment amid this crisis. So that's a signal of how powerful that tool is. Uh, Whimsical I mentioned as the flowchart tool. I know I'm moving through these quickly, um, but uh, again, you can access all these tools on the document link I'm gonna give you at the end of this session. These are all opportunities for us to be creative um, with our exercises. We all have a million meetings. So just a word about this, I'm gonna say more about this in the webinar tomorrow about um, digital efficiency and organization, but I think we should use a scheduling tool. I think we should limit how many meetings we participate in. I think meetings should be shorter and fewer people should participate in them. Um, again, I'll say more about that tomorrow in the webinar um, tomorrow morning at 9.30. Uh, there are, uh, Calendly is a great tool for managing this. Um, this is a, a big challenge for us now that we're doing everything remotely and there's some other free tools listed here. My favorite new tool, and I can't, I can't stop talking about this these days, is called Rome. And I, I'm gonna do a whole separate session about Rome. It's a brand new paradigm for note-taking and organizing notes. I'm gonna say a little bit more about it tomorrow. But uh, Rome Research is just an amazing new tool. Um, and it does away with folders. It's a, it's a very different approach to notes. Um, it uses only kind of tags and bi-directional links. Um, so if you're curious, check it out. I will say more about it tomorrow. Let's move to the closer. Uh, closers should allow us to assess whether people understand, they should bridge to the content, they should conclude and wrap things up, they should delve a little deeper, give us an elegant exit to the session, and, and we should finish on time, which I'm gonna try to do. We can end with a game. Uh, we don't have time for that today, but I love Kahoot. I've been playing it with my little girls and their friends. I'm playing it as a family. Um, you can play it with your students. It's just a really fun way to ask questions. Um, here are a few closers we can do. Give me an exit ticket. So a takeaway from this session and something you're curious about. Um, a little summary of some key topic, uh, what I know, what I want to know more about, and what I've learned recently about this, and again, a, a quick quiz or a game. There are all kinds of skills within journalism that we want people to develop, and whatever your field is, there are all kinds of skills you want people to develop, and I think we should be really clear about what our learning objectives are and what we can do in one session. So I hope in this session, you've come away with a little bit of um, some new ideas for openers and for closers and from activities in between, some new tools you might be curious about. Anything you want to delve further into um, will be in this document, hopefully, um, if I've included everything and I'll add to it. It's a living document, bit.ly.com slash teaching 2025. I'll paste that in here um, to the chat as well. And uh, you can go to that and you'll see it's already live. And uh, I'll 
be adding to it um, a little bit to make sure I've included everything. You can email me with follow-up questions or follow-up comments, jeremy at jeremykaplan.com. Follow me on Twitter. You can cook an appointment with me, any of you who would like to chat. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick final polls, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and uh, first is about the length. Um, obviously, you hear me talking quickly, and, uh, and that's because I want to respect your time, and you have so much else to do today. But how do you like the length of, of, the, of the session? Is it a good length? Do you prefer something even a little quicker, and, and you can just interrupt your day and get something quicker? Would you prefer something a little longer? Um, you can answer the poll on your screen just for quick input. You can also ask any final questions in the chat, and I'm going to wrap up quickly to maintain my promise of, of ending on time. Um, okay, a, a bunch of you say uh, 30 minutes is a good length. Um, at least one person says 45 minutes would be a, a slightly better length. Um, if anyone else has final input, um, you can put that in there or email me separately. I'm going to end that poll, and um, you see the results up there. Um, and somebody likes 15 minutes as well. So, so we've got a whole range of different, uh, different preferences there. Um, thank you so much for your participation today, for joining in this mini micro webinar. I, I, uh, I consider this a bit of an experiment like much of what I do. I hope this has been useful for you. I hope that you have a fantastic day ahead of you and a great vacation. Those of you uh, who have a, a spring break coming up or something like it this weekend. Uh, coming up. Um, I wish you the best and I wish you all well and good health in your families and situations and thank you for coming. Feel free to send me any questions or follow-ups you have and with that we'll conclude and again tomorrow morning anyone who wants to join different topics some different tools and resources um, focused on digital organizations so you're welcome to join then as well 9 30. Thanks everyone and have a great day.